Voltaire, that is to say, François-Marie Arouet, was born at Paris in 1694, the son of a comfortably successful notary and a somewhat aristocratic mother. He owed to his father, perhaps, his shrewdness and irascibility, and to his mother something of his levity and wit. He came into the world, so to speak, by a narrow margin. His mother did not survive his birth, and he was so puny and sickly an infant that the nurse did not give him more than a day to live. She was slightly in error, as he lived almost to eighty-four. But throughout his life his frail body tormented with illness his unconquerable spirit. He had for his edification a model elder brother, Armand, a pious lad who fell in love with the Jansenist heresy and courted martyrdom for his faith. Well, said Armand to a friend who advised the better part of valor, if you do not want to be hanged, at least do not put off other people. The father said he had two fools for his sons, one in verse and the other in prose. The fact that Francois made verses almost as soon as he could write his name convinced his very practical father that nothing good would come of him. But the famous Hetaira, Ninon de L'Enclos, who lived in the provincial town to which the ROAs had returned after the birth of Francois, saw in the youth signs of greatness, and when she died she left him two thousand francs for the purchase of books. His early education came from these and from a dissolute abbé, a Jérôme Coignard in the flesh, who taught him skepticism along with his prayers. His later educators, the Jesuits, gave him the very instrument of skepticism by teaching him dialectic, the art of proving anything, and therefore at last the habit of believing nothing. Francois became an adept at argument. While the boys played games in the fields, he, aged twelve, stayed behind to discuss theology with the doctors. When the time came for him to earn his living, he scandalized his father by proposing to take up literature as a profession. Literature, said Monsieur Arouet, is the profession of the man who wishes to be useless to society and a burden to his relatives and to die of hunger. One can see the table trembling under his emphasis. So Francois went in for literature. Not that he was a quiet and merely studious lad. He burnt the midnight oil of others. He took to staying out late, frolicking with the wits and roisterers of the town, and experimenting with the commandments, until his exasperated father sent him off to a relative at Caen with instructions to keep the youth practically in confinement. But his jailer fell in love with his wit and soon gave him free reign. After imprisonment, now as later, came exile. His father sent him to The Hague with the French ambassador, requesting strict surveillance of the madcap boy. But Francois at once fell in love with a little lady, Pampette held breathless clandestine interviews with her and wrote to her passionate letters ending always with the refrain, I shall certainly love you forever. The affair was discovered and he was sent home. He remembered Pampette for several weeks. In 1715, proud of his 21 years, he went to Paris just in time to be in at the death of Louis the Fourteenth. The succeeding Louis being too young to govern France, much less Paris, the power fell into the hands of a regent, and during this quasi-interregnum life ran riot in the capital of the world, and young Arouet ran with it. He soon achieved a reputation as a brilliant and reckless lad. When the regent, for economy, sold half the horses that filled the royal stables, Francois remarked how much more sensible it would have been to dismiss half the asses that filled the royal court. At last all the bright and naughty things whispered about Paris were fathered upon him and it was his ill luck that these included two poems accusing the regent of desiring to usurp the throne. The regent raged, and meeting the youth in the park one day, said to him, Monsieur Arouet, I will wager that I can show you something that you have never seen before. What is that? The inside of the Bastille. Arouet saw it the next day, April 16, 1717. While in the Bastille, he adopted, for some unknown reason, the pen name of Voltaire, and became a poet in earnest and at length. Before he had served eleven months, he had written a long and not unworthy epic, the Henriade, telling the story of Henry of Navarre. Then the regent, having discovered perhaps that he had imprisoned an innocent man, released him and gave him a pension, whereupon Voltaire wrote thanking him for so taking care of his board, and begging permission hereafter to take care of his lodging himself. He passed now almost with a bound from the prison to the stage. His tragedy, Oedipe, 
was produced in 1718 and broke all the records of Paris by running for 45 consecutive nights. His old father, coming to upbraid him, sat in a box and covered his joy by grumbling at every hit, Oh, the rascal, the rascal! When the fond Fontenelle met Voltaire after the play and damned it with high praise, saying it was too brilliant for tragedy, Voltaire replied, smiling, I must reread your pastorals. The youth was in no mood for caution or for courtesy. Had he not put into the play itself these reckless lines? Our priests are not what simple folk suppose. Their learning is but our credulity. Act 4, Scene 1 and into the mouth of a rasp this epoch-making challenge. Let us trust to ourselves, see all with our own eyes. Let these be our oracles, our tripods, and our gods. Act Two, Scene Five. The play netted Voltaire four thousand francs, which he proceeded to invest with a wisdom unheard of in literary men. Through all his tribulations he kept the art not merely of making a spacious income, but of putting it to work. He respected the classic adage that one must live before one can philosophize. In 1729, he bought up all the tickets in a poorly planned government lottery and made a large sum, much to the anger of the government. But as he became rich, he became ever more generous, and a growing circle of protégés gathered about him as he passed into the afternoon of life. It was well that he added an almost Hebraic subtlety of finance to his Gallic cleverness of pen, for his next play, Artemir, failed. Voltaire felt the failure keenly. Every triumph sharpens the sting of later defeats. He was always painfully sensitive to public opinion and envied the animals because they do not know what people say of them. Fate added to his dramatic failure a bad case of smallpox. He cured himself by drinking 120 pints of lemonade and somewhat less of physic. When he came out of the shadow of death, he found that his Henriade had made him famous. He boasted, with reason, that he had made poetry the fashion. He was received and fated everywhere. The aristocracy caught him up and turned him into a polished man of the world, an unequaled master of conversation and the inheritor of the finest cultural tradition in Europe. For eight years he basked in the sunshine of the salons, and then fortune turned away. Some of the aristocracy could not forget that this young man had no other title to place and honor than that of genius, and could not quite forgive him for the distinction. During a dinner at the Duc de Sully's chateau, after Voltaire had held forth for some minutes with unabashed eloquence and wit, the Chevalier de Rohan asked, not sotto voce, Who is the young man who talks so loud? My lord, answered Voltaire quickly, he is the one who does not carry a great name, but wins respect for the name he has. To answer the Chevalier at all was impertinent, to answer him unanswerably was treason. The Honorable Lord engaged a band of ruffians to assault Voltaire by night, merely cautioning them, Don't hit his head, something good may come out of that yet. The next day at the theater, Voltaire appeared, bandaged and limping, walked up to Rohan's box and challenged him to a duel. Then he went home and spent all day practicing with the foils. But the noble chevalier had no mind to be precipitated into heaven, or elsewhere, by a mere genius. He appealed to his cousin, who was Minister of Police, to protect him. Voltaire was arrested, and found himself again in his old home, the Bastille, privileged once more to view the world from the inside. He was almost immediately released, on condition that he go into exile in England. He went, but after being escorted to Dover, he recrossed the Channel in disguise, burning to avenge himself. Warned that he had been discovered, and was about to be arrested a third time, he took ship again, and reconciled himself to three years in England, 1726 to 29. London, Letters on the English He set to work with courage to master the new language. He was displeased to find that plague had one syllable and ague two. He wished that plague would take one half the language and ague the other half. But soon he could read English well, and within a year he was master of the best English literature of the age. He was introduced to the literati by Lord Bob.